peace. We hear that word and we envision something without conflict. Peace involves that, but there's so much more. Peace is a restored state of wholeness. The birth of Jesus announces the arrival of peace and the death of Jesus creates peace with God. And when the angels proclaim peace on earth, the shepherds heard what our hearts long to hear, that God is indeed restoring all of it to his original and glorious purposes. So may we experience that kind of peace. It's an invitation for every person and it's here now because Jesus is here now. This is peace. Welcome to Christmas. One day after the service, the preacher was standing out in the lobby as, as John and I often do after services. He was greeting folks uh, as they were leaving. And uh, there was a, a little lady that came up to him and she said, Pastor said, I just want you to know that your sermon today, it reminded me of the peace and the love of God. And and the preacher said, well, I appreciate that. He goes, but I'm a little bit confused. He goes, I didn't preach about the peace and the love of God today. He said, how did you get that out of it? And she said, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it surpassed all understanding. And she said, it reminded me of the love of God because it just seemed like it was going to endure forever. Um, so today, I am going to preach on peace, but hopefully it won't seem to endure uh, forever. This morning, we come to the final message in our series entitled, He Shall Be Called, and we've talked about how he is called the Messiah. He is the Christ, the anointed one, the one that, was, that God chose before creation of the world because he knew we would go astray and we would need to be brought back into a right relationship with him, and it would require God becoming flesh, which was week two. We talked about Emmanuel, God with us. He became one of us, lived as one of us for 33 years, and then even after the cross, he sent his spirit, and he is still with us today. Last week, we talked about how he's the wonderful counselor. He not only wants to save us, but he wants to guide us and be a part of our daily life today. This morning, we're going to look at his title as the Prince of Peace. And before we start, I want to jump back to our main text from this series, which again is in Isaiah chapter 9. Let's look at it again, verse 6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You know, Christmas is a time when we celebrate the arrival of, of Jesus, our Messiah, the, the Prince of Peace. And this morning, I want to just focus in on that one title of Prince of Peace. First of all, I want us to see that Jesus came to bring us peace with God, peace with God. The Hebrew term for peace is shalom. And the, the Jewish people often use that as a greeting to one another. Like we might say, hey, or how you doing? They would often say, shalom. And it's meant to be a reference to the appearance of calm, of this inward tranquility uh, within an individual, but also among groups of people. And so they greeted each other by saying, may peace be upon you, shalom. The Greek word is erene, which it has the same type of meaning of peace, inner rest, harmony in your, in your soul. And the gospel is about how Jesus came to bring peace between God, a holy God, and sinful man. And it, it says in Colossians chapter 1, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. Watch. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he's brought you into his own presence. And you're holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Friends, that is the greatest gift of Christmas. That is what Jesus came to do, to be the Prince of Peace who brings peace between sinful man and a holy God. The text says that we were once considered enemies of God. 
And, and I, you've heard me say this time and again, but I'll continue to say it. If you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and accepted his sacrifice on the cross as the payment for your sins, you remain an enemy of God. And we start out in life when we're separated by sin. We're not all basically good people that are all headed to heaven as long as we don't mess up. We are enemies of God unless we have been reconciled through faith in Christ. And so we were separated from him by the stain of sin. Missionary Don Richardson served for many years among the primitive tribes in Papua New Guinea. And he wrote a book entitled The Peace Child. And in that book, he tells the story of two tribes in Papua New Guinea who maintained a blood feud between them, and they fought for several generations. But after years of struggle, the two tribes realized they must stop fighting or nothing would be left of their people pretty soon. But what could they do to end all the animosity between the two tribes and bring peace? Richardson tells that one of the chiefs, in an amazing act, brought his own infant son and he placed him in the arms of his adversary. The child was to live with the enemy tribe for the rest of his life. And as long as that child lived, there would be peace between the two tribes. Because in their culture, the idea was that if a man would give his own son to his enemies, that man could be trusted. Don said he was able to take that amazing act and use it as an, 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 an analogy to explain what Jesus had done for us. And shortly thereafter, the New Testament was translated into their language and published for them to read, and many people started coming to Christ in those two tribes. And many villagers uh, came to know Christ as the peace child. Sometime later, Don returned with his three sons, and he found the people there still faithfully serving Christ. And he says, in fact, while we were there, 250 more people were baptized in an amazing acknowledgement that Christ is our peace child that God gave to reconcile between holy God and sinful man. So the primary focus of Jesus' first coming was to establish spiritual peace between God and man. And he did that through the cross. So the first bit of good news that I have for you today is that the greatest Christmas gift that has ever been given or ever will be given is peace with God through faith in Jesus and his redeeming work on the cross. If you don't have that gift today, I pray that you don't leave without it when you, when you head out the doors today. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. So the greatest gift is peace with God, but I also want to talk to you about the peace of God. Salvation is the most wonderful gift God has given us, but it's not the only one. Maybe you've watched those late night infomercials before and they're selling you a product and telling you all the great things about that product, but just when you think they're done, they go, but wait, there's more. And they talk about another gift that comes with this if you order within the next 30 minutes or so. And so there's a sense of urgency. You get a two-for-one deal here. And so I'm telling you today, church, wait. There's more. John 14, 27, Jesus said, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus offers us spiritual peace with God, but he also offers us a peace in our minds and our hearts right now. You know, I think a lot of people in sense that this world is out of control. Maybe you've despaired as you watch the news and maybe you come home from your job and you feel like my job, life, my, my career is out of control. I, I, I just carry such a burden in my, my workplace. Or maybe you come home in your family life, you think my marriage, it's, it's out of control. I just wish I had peace. My, my, my children, they're out of control. My finances, they're out of control. Life in general is just out of control. What are some of the signs that you're lacking peace? Sometimes I think you can live with a lack of peace so long that you forget what normal life was like. You ever felt that way? And maybe sometimes this lack of peace comes out as stress. You're stressed when you feel incapable of dealing with everything on your plate. You just feel overwhelmed. You feel drained. 
How many of you, if you're honest, have been stressed for the last few weeks getting ready for Christmas? Is that a stressful time for, for anybody? Or maybe there's something else, some other issues that are just stressing you out and you say, oh, Greg, I just wish I had some peace. For some, the lack of peace comes out as insecurity. You lack confidence and you're always doubting yourself and second-guessing yourself. You look for approval from others and it, it drives you crazy when you don't get it and you worry yourself about that. And you're insecure and you just wish you had peace. For some, it's anxiety. You're, you frequently feel worried or nervous about something and sometimes you don't even really know what it is. You just feel this nervous feeling and as, as if something bad is about to happen. You may even have physical symptoms like a, a rapid heartbeat. Your heart just races or you feel like you're going to hyperventilate or you get nauseous, or whatever it might be. But some in this room, I'm convinced, struggle with anxiety and you just say, oh, I just wish I had a, a peace. Or maybe for you, it's a feeling of depression. You're generally unhappy. Sometimes you could point to why. Other times you just, in general, you just, you just feel unhappy. You're often plagued by feelings of guilt, shame, helplessness, hopelessness. You don't see it ever being, life ever being any better than it is now. And you often withdraw from people and activities that you once enjoyed. And you just wish you had peace so that you could enjoy your life the way everybody else seems to be enjoying theirs. And finally, for some, it's conflict. Christmas can be tough when families get together and sometimes there are some awkward situations you have to negotiate around. You seem to frequently experience tension in your relationships with your family, in your workplace, or maybe in your social circles, and you just say, I just wish we could skip the drama and just have peace. Jesus not only offers us peace with God for eternity, but listen, he offers us peace of mind now. Friends, that's good news. In John 16, he says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. Now, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm not going to mislead you. In this world, being a Christian doesn't mean you get out of all the problems and the challenges and the stresses. Yes, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Christians too. But then I love the last part of that verse where he says, but take heart because I've overcome this world. This world isn't all that there is. You know, you can endure most anything if you know it's just for a season, can't you? If I can, can just buckle down and study hard, the semester break is almost here. Or if I can just maintain this crazy pace until I get to graduation and then I can breathe and catch my breath and then take on a career. If I can just get through while the children are little and they're just running everywhere and there's never a quiet moment in the house and get them to where they're a little bit older, then I'll trade these problems for different problems. But I'll, I'll do something if I just know there's an end in sight, I can get through this, especially if you know there's a reward on the other side. And I just tell you, church, thank God this world is not all there is. Amen? I don't know what you're, you're going through, but I'm telling you this. The Christian can have peace, not because of the problems of your life are gone, but I'm talking about you can have peace amidst the trials and storms of this life. I read that in 1955, Dr. Nicholas Ridley was sentenced to be burned at the stake in England because of his witness for Christ. And on the night before his execution, his brother came to offer him some comfort and offered to stay with him that night so that he could comfort him uh, leading up to the day of his execution. Ridley declined the offer saying, I intend God willing to go to bed and sleep as quietly tonight as I ever did. Because he knew the peace of God, he could rest in the strength of the everlasting arms of the Lord despite an unthinkable situation going around him. I have talked with believers recently who are facing very critical health news. And we've had the conversation and they've told me I feel like God's got this. Either way, if, if I get through this and I come out on the other side healed, then praise God to live as Christ. 
But if this is the time God has appointed for me to leave this earth and to go home, to die is gain. And God's got this either way. And I could sense that it was real. It was something that they meant and they said, I, I really, I feel at peace. It's in God's hands. Friends, how do people who don't believe in Jesus Christ come to grips with situations like that? But in Christ, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And either way, we're in the hands of God and he's got this. Psalm chapter four, verse eight says, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So that sounds good, but I know somebody's thinking, come on, Greg, that's nice Sunday morning church talk. Yes, I would love to have peace amidst all the situations in my life, but how do you really do that? How does that really happen? Well, I, I'll just tell you, the scriptures that I come back to and I meditate upon, Philippians 4, 6 through 7 is one of them. And he instructs us what to do and then he gives us a promise that goes with it. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. I've preached this recently, so I won't beleaguer the point. But listen, if you're worrying about it, pray about it. And, and if maybe if you say, I'm so stressed, I'm asking you, how's your prayer life? Are you really turning it over to him in faith? Are you really talking to God about the concerns of your heart? And then he says, if you'll do that, and you'll do that with thanksgiving, remembering all God has done for you, he says, then, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus, as you live in Christ Jesus when you're going through a period of, of a lack of peace, it's important to humble yourself before God. Confess any known sin. Cast it off and say, God, I, I am completely yours. Would you please come and give me the peace my soul needs? And trust that the peace that passes all understanding, it's a peace that doesn't even make sense. I've seen people going through horrible situations in life, but they're held together and it doesn't even make sense. How are you still standing? And they'll say it's the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Isaiah 26.3 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You know, everywhere Jesus goes, he brings peace. And I ask you, is he central in your life? Or do you feel like he's out there somewhere and you kind of reached for him when you need him? But friends, the best place in life to be is to have Jesus in the center of everything. And that's the only way you'll have this peace that passes all understanding. Well, finally, I want to share with you not, about, not just about peace with God and the peace of God, but I want to talk about peace to come. Peace to come. Let's go back to our main text for this series, but I want to read a little bit further to show you what I'm talking about next. Again, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. I, I used to wonder and scratch my head at what that was talking about because I didn't see that the first time Jesus came. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Then it goes on. His government... And its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. Now I'm thankful that Christmas is a celebration of the many prophecies that were fulfilled in his life, in his teaching, in his crucifixion, his resurrection. The only ones that have not yet been fulfilled are the ones that pertain to his second coming. And as we think about the Prince of Peace there seems to be a little bit that's still to be fulfilled when you think about it. According to a New York Times article, over the past 3,400 years of recorded history, the world has been entirely at peace only 268 out of those years. Estimates of the total number of people killed in wars throughout history range from 150 million to a billion. Now that doesn't sound like peace, an everlasting peace ruling on this earth. Today's headlines are filled with stories of war, whether it's uh, over in Ukraine or whether it's in, in Gaza, but there's all kinds of things going on and we say, where is, the, where is the peace? 
Isaiah wrote this prophecy at least 600 years before the birth of Jesus, and it's often quoted at, at Christmas time. And as we've seen, this prophecy that we just talked about, it's been fulfilled in a spiritual sense. You can have peace through the Prince of Peace, Jesus, and his death on the cross. But I believe there's also a literal fulfillment of this prophecy coming. I believe there is also a physical fulfillment of this prophecy to come. John MacArthur says this, this verse looks to a time still future when Christ will reign over a literal, earthly, geopolitical kingdom that encompasses all the kingdoms and governments of the world. The prophet Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. King Nebuchadnezzar had, had dreamed about uh, a huge statue that was the head was made of one thing, the shoulders of another, of these different substances. And, and Daniel interpreted the dream to mean that the head represents the Babylonian empire, but then each, each successive part coming down the statue represented a succeeding empire. And many of those empires we have seen fulfilled in Daniel's prophecy, from the Babylonians to the Medo-Persian empire, to the Greeks, to the, the Romans. But then it talks about the, the feet. There's one more empire that's yet to be fulfilled and that empire we believe will arise in the last days. But then he talks about this huge stone that comes down and it, and it crushes this statue. And we pick up in Daniel 2 verses 44 through 45. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms, that statue that Daniel's telling about. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands, that crushed the pieces of the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is certain. When Jesus was born, the angel reiterated this idea of a literal kingdom to, in the prophecy to Mary. Look at her at this prophecy in Luke 1. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Watch. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Daniel and the prophecy of the angel coming together in fulfillment in Jesus, but not all of that prophecy has yet been fulfilled. There is a coming day when I believe the government will rest upon his shoulders. In the meantime, he rules and reigns figuratively and spiritually in the hearts of his believers and of his church, but I believe there is a physical, a literal fulfillment yet to come. As we think about it, some might say, well, Greg, that's all allegorical. You're making too much of this. But I ask you, the, the prophecies of his first coming, were they fulfilled uh, allegorically, spiritualized, or were they fulfilled literally? When it said he would be born of a virgin, was that just allegorical or was it literal? When it said he would be born in Bethlehem, was that just meaning in that area or was he born right in Bethlehem? It was fulfilled literally. When it said he would teach in parables, that he would work wonders, that he would, be, he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, all of those things were fulfilled literally in Jesus Christ at his first coming. So why would we say the prophecies about his second coming are all allegorical? You see, I believe there is a literal fulfillment to come. Listen, we... We've never really experienced lasting physical peace on earth for the past 2,000 years since Christ was proclaimed the Prince of Peace. Now, spiritually, he can be the Prince of Peace in your heart today. But I assure you that God is not one to fail or fall short on any of his promises. There is a coming day when King Jesus is coming again and he will literally rule and reign over his eternal kingdom. He will rule as king over Israel and the nations of the world. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and it will be a time of great peace. He will bring about justice to the nations. Even nature, the Bible says, will live at peace. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. Children can play near the, the, the uh, den of a cobra and not be in fear. Satan will be bound and later cast into the lake of fire. God will fulfill his covenant promises to the descendants of Abraham. To this point, Israel has never yet possessed all of the land that God promised them in a covenant in Genesis chapter 15. They will. God promised that King David's heir would sit on the throne of Israel forever. 
He will. God will make the enemies of Christ his footstool. He will. God is currently allowing sin to run its course. The world is feeling the weight of that curse of sin today. The Bible says that we groan as a woman in childbirth and we feel the birth pains of a coming kingdom and we feel the weight of all this sin and darkness and sickness and disease and tragedy and violence and evil. But I'm telling you, there will come a stone that will crush the earthly kingdoms of this world and that kingdom will never end and he shall reign forevermore. But you can be assured that the hope of Jesus is coming to right every wrong. He will bring an end to the curse of sin. He will establish his kingdom as the prince of peace, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. Now, the way to be a part of this literal kingdom and to rule and reign with him then is to be a part of his spiritual kingdom that he's already established by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, letting him be the Lord of your life now that he can be your king of kings and Lord of lords when he rules over his kingdom. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, if we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. I want to close by saying this. This Christmas, open your heart to peace. Maybe you've heard of the American poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In 1861, Longfellow's wife died in an accident where her dress caught on fire. And Longfellow had tried to extinguish the flames first by taking a rug and trying to to suffocate the flames. But then, in desperation, he threw his own body onto his wife trying to extinguish the flames. And as I said, she perished. He survived, but he suffered burns himself. He stopped shaving due to the severe burns on his face and thus he had this long beard that he's often known for if you've seen pictures of of Longfellow. As a widowed father of six children, his grief was so severe that he worried he might have to be committed to an asylum. Two years later in 1863, his son Charles left without his father's blessing to join the Union Army during the Civil War. And several months later, Longfellow received the news that his son Charles had been seriously wounded in the Battle of Mine Run. The story goes on that it was Christmas Day in 1863 and Longfellow sat down to write a poem in which he sought to capture all the emotion that he was feeling in his heart, the grief, the despondency. It's said that as he wrote the poem, he heard the church bells ringing, the Christmas bells ringing in the distance. And then he heard the singing of a song that declared the words from Luke chapter 2, verse 14, saying, peace on earth and goodwill to men. And in his heart at that time, he said, I I just saw that there was a, a disconnect. As I think about the injustice in this old cruel world and the tragedy in his own life, he contemplated how it just seemed to mock the, the raw optimism of such a song. But as you listen to the lyrics of Longfellow's poem that has now been beautifully turned into a song, you can sense his thought process shifting throughout the song. Eventually, he comes back around to a faith that God still is in control, that God is still for us, and that God still will rule and reign over this world, that he is alive and he will prevail. It's a song of hope and peace amidst the uncertainties of this life. Let me tell you something, church. There are times in life that force us to make a decision about what we believe about the Bible. There is a Sunday morning faith, I call it, that we can come and we can sit in a crowd like this and we can nod our head and maybe even say amen. But then life hits and you're in a situation and you have to answer the question, do I really believe this? Can I really claim these promises to be sure and true? And will they really hold me together? Now, I don't know if you've been through times like that. I have. And I can tell you this, they have defined my faith over the years. The times that God allowed me to be driven to my knees and to question, do I really believe all the things that I stand in a pulpit and say? And I'm telling you today, the resounding answer is yes. Yes, I believe it with all of my heart. And I hope you can say the same. God is faithful. He wants to be the prince of peace in your life spiritually. He wants to give you peace in your heart and in your mind. And he is coming to rule this world and to bring a lasting peace. 
I've asked the worship team if they would sing this song, and I, I love it. I'd sing it as our invitation song. I encourage you to carefully listen to the words and know that they were written by Longfellow in his pain as he's hearing this Christmas carol being sung, proclaiming things that he is in his Sunday morning faith believed to be true, but now he's having to reconcile it. Do I really believe this? And as you listen to this song, ask yourself, do I have peace with God? Am I confident that if this was my last day that to live is Christ but to die is gain? Am I okay with that? Do I have peace within? Do I really believe that God is holding me together? Even as my life seems to be coming apart, he's got me in the palm of his hand. You know, you can't find true peace without knowing. Knowing, not religion, but knowing the Prince of Peace himself. Maybe you sense that this Christmas you have a particular need of the Prince of Peace in your life. You know, as we stand in just a moment, I ask if you will, stand to your feet. And if you would like to receive the Prince of Peace as your Savior and your Lord, please come over there and talk to us about it today. But we always issue a time of prayer and we invite you to come and to lay your burdens down. But today, as we focus on the Prince of Peace, I just want to issue a special call. Don't leave today carrying burdens. Come to the Prince of Peace and lay them down. Yes, on Christmas Eve, what better time than to come and say, God, I need your peace to rule and reign in my heart, in my family, in my marriage, in my, my children, and, and, and everything going on in my life today. I give it to you. Will you come, old Prince of Peace, and be the wonderful counselor in my life that I need today? Come as he calls you today and as we sing.